You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode 88. Today we're talking about highly sensitive children. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you're thriving, when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clarkfield's Mindfulness Mama Mentor. I coach overstressed moms on how to cultivate self-awareness in their daily lives and to take family and life to a new level of awakening. I've been practicing yoga and mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting Course, and I'm the mom of two girls ages 7 and 10. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for listening today. Uh, This is going to be a very cool episode. It's an interview. We have... um, an interview with Melissa Schwartz, who is an expert on highly sensitive children. And it's a, this was a fascinating conversation for me to have. Uh, you're going to learn the four traits of highly sensitive children and tips to for dealing with highly sensitive children. So uh, for me, this was a really, really fascinating, really highly engaging conversation. So I hope that really comes through with you and listening to the episode. Right now, we are registering people right now for the Mindful Parenting course. And this is an exciting time because the course only opens up for live registration now on in the fall and in the spring. And we're not offering the self-study version during the middle of the year now. So this is the time to do your mindful parenting course. And really, you know, we want to do it now because we don't want to waste this precious time. We don't want to waste this precious time with our kids. So why wait another six months? Like get those skills now. And the reason mindful parenting is different is because it, you know, the other parenting trainings and courses and, and books, they don't really tell you that as soon as your stress response kicks in, all that good information is gone and inaccessible, really, in the brain. And so mindful parenting really addresses that and helps you to calm down your stress response, helps you to understand your stories and understand your triggers and really practice that deep, nourishing, mindful self-care so that you can have real, authentic, authentic presence with your kids. It's kind of like the how of conscious parenting, right? And then once we're able to do that within ourselves and we take sort of the first half of the course to do that, then we, you learn the, the best skillful communication modalities that are out there. It's really, really powerful. You learn how to parent without punishment. It's really amazing. So that is open and registering right now. And I've been doing some fun, exciting things um, in a pop-up Facebook group we have that you can join up with. So I hope you will check that out at mindfulparentingcourse.com and and join us and and join this journey, you know, get the help you need. It's that the whole idea that this is supposed to be instinctual is completely, you know, bananas. Uh, You know, maybe it's instinctual when our, our kids are infants and babies, but really, We come at this with so many strong habit energies, right, handed down from our parents and our ancestors and things like that. And and what we think is instinctual is really from our culture. And mindful parenting is about changing those cultural conditioned habits that aren't so great, right? And so we we learn how to do that. And... um, I think that's it. Let's dive into this interview on highly sensitive children. It it segues so perfectly with mindful parenting because this is another how, right, for highly sensitive children. But if you have highly sensitive children, this is going to be an amazing episode for you. So let's dive right in. I'm so excited to have with us here on the Mindful Mom podcast today, Melissa Schwartz. And Melissa is a respected expert in the field of highly sensitive children and brings a clarity and personal experience and compassion for parents who raise highly sensitive children so that they can thrive in a desensitized world. Oh my gosh, a desensitized world? That sounds so scary, Melissa. (laughs) What do you mean when you say a desensitized world? Yeah, what I mean by that is... (laughs) 
That, well, let me start here by saying that one in five people are highly sensitive. So that means that about 20% of the population is walking around in a sort of perpetual state of sensory overwhelm. They are just taking in more information than the average person. And so when I talk about the desensitized world, I'm talking about the layman's world, the the world that we're all experiencing that doesn't recognize that 20% of the population is actually having a heightened experience all the time. So it doesn't have to be so scary once you learn some tools, once you learn some strategies to handle your sensitivity to bring out the best of it because it is sort of a double-edged you know, coin. It's got its ups and its downs. Um, but what it is that I really help people do is learn how to thrive in the world that wasn't necessarily set up for them to have it easy. Oh my God. I'm, I'm really fascinated by this because I think I'm, I have like inklings that maybe I was like a highly sensitive kid. Like I think maybe my dad was like, and definitely think my oldest daughter might be, <laughs> she's definitely falls into that category of uh, like a spirited child. You know, there's um, that wonderful book about that. And, um, and I'm just kind of interested in, but I imagine you, well, we, your mother also teaches parenting and things like that. But I imagine, which we'll get into, which I'm really fascinated about, but I'm imagine that you, your something about this is that that you yourself may have dealt with this sort of highly sensitive child thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so um that is why I love doing this work, right? It's like um for me to teach other highly sensitive people about the trait and about um tools to thrive as a sensitive being. Um, for me, it all comes full circle. You know, these are all things that I've learned through my own experience, through my own research. Um, but I, I keep hearing you talk about being a highly sensitive child. And I want to say that our inner child stays with us throughout <laughs> our life. So if we're born highly sensitive, we are highly sensitive adults. And, um, you know, one of the things that I love to start with when I talk to parents about um, understanding their sensitive children is temperament and hardwiring, mm-hmm. right? Because um, there are these kind of nine clinical aspects of hardwiring that um, kind of put together this lens of how we experience the world. When we, when we see, um, so for example, sensitivity is an aspect of temperament. So I like to think that I am really high on that spectrum of sensitivity. I personally am really high on the spectrum of intensity. Those tend to travel together, as you mentioned, the spirited child. Um, some other aspects of temperament include things like activity level, um, body rhythms, mood, um, adaptability to change. Um, these are all different uh, things that we are hardwired in a certain Um, point on this spectrum. So I love to start with parents, start talking to parents about temperament because this never changes throughout our whole life. Um, Sometimes I talk about temperament like a car. Um, You know, there are, if when you go out to buy a car, you might choose to buy a Prius. It's pretty low maintenance. Doesn't ask a whole lot of you. doesn't care what kind of put a gas, what kind of gas goes into it. You can skip an oil change. It'll get you from here to there. It'll be pretty reliable. But some people prefer to go for something like a Porsche, like a fancy, sporty, fun-to-drive car that's also high needs. It wants high test gas. It wants regular maintenance. It wants premium tires that are regularly balanced and rotated, right? And if you don't give it what it needs, it can't perform as well as it wants to. And the sensitive child is like the Porsche. They are a high needs being. They require certain things that the Prius doesn't require, right? And so what it is that I help parents do is is get that Porsche functioning in a world where there are potholes and there are speed bumps and there are um, breakdowns, right? The car might overheat. And I sort of act as this translator for parents. I can help interpret the behavior. I can interpret those check engine lights, those breakdowns that happen in the car and help a parent understand what it means and what that child is really needing so that we can get that child back into peak performance and they can be really fun to get on the road. Um, you know, the, the typical child, the, um, you know, when we talk about hardwiring, we talk about sort of three generalizations. The easygoing child is the way that we refer to this um, kind of Prius child. They just don't ask a whole lot, right? Those are the, if you've got one of those kids, you're probably not listening to this podcast because yeah. 
they, they, they are generally just pretty easygoing. They respond okay to life. They're not having a hard time. But if you've got a kid who's got big emotions, who feels things deeply, who picks up on other people's energy, who becomes overwhelmed, they have tantrums, they've just been, you know, a cha- more challenging child. There's nothing wrong with them, but they might be highly sensitive. And so once you can kind of learn some tools to help them, then you're going to have a really fun ride. They're going to be the most, that, and that's, that's the gift of the sensitive kid, right? They're is the Porsche. <laughs> they're the Porsche. A Porsche, a peak Prius and a peak Porsche. Which one do you want to drive? You want that <laughs> Porsche, right? That's a fun ride. So that's my goal is I get Porsches back on the road. <laughs> that, that's amazing. I really, that's a really interesting analogy that the analogy that um, that I heard that resonates with me, and I'm wondering if this kind of makes sense to you, is the idea of like the the dandelion and the orchid. You know, like a like a dandelion can kind of grow and bloom and thrive in lots of places under lots of conditions, and the orchid kind of needs some special care and needs some you know special you know extra sensitive kind of environment and things like that, and then it can be you know really. Um, grow and thrive. So I I I love it. It's perfect metaphor. Oh, good, good. I've shared that one with my daughter and she was like, oh, now she's, she's 10 now. And she's like, oh, okay. She, that kind of resonated with her. So, so highly sensitive people tell us, tell us what highly sensitive kids and, and highly sensitive adult, how do we know if we have a highly sensitive kid? Yeah, it's a great question. And one thing that I'll um, encourage you, your listeners to do is if you look up Elaine Aaron, her last name is A-R-O-N. She's basically the the pioneer researcher in understanding high sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Um, And I want to say that what highly sensitive people have, the trait that we have is called sensory processing sensitivity. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It means that our sensory, our sensory systems process information more sensitively, right? So we're taking in more subtleties. So that's one of the first common traits of uh, highly sensitive people. There are four um, common traits that are found in sensitive people. Mm. The first is that they have um, a stronger depth of processing, meaning they notice subtleties. um, They take things in more deeply on many different levels. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how this might play out. So personally, I am a really visual person. I used to be a professional photographer. I see color differently than most people. And it's amazing. You know, um, I, I see thousands, millions, billions. I don't know, even know, like to me, color is just this beautiful, amazing experience. And most people, when I, you know, when I do talks and workshops, there's usually a picture in the room and I'll say, how many shades of green do you see in that? For example, and people say two, three, and I'm like, well, I see 200 or I see 300 in there. And so, um, for me, that's one way that sensitivity plays out is I know that, you know, I notice when somebody gets a haircut, I notice a new shade of lipstick. I'll see that, you know, I can, I can tell from the, the, the energy that you're bringing, um, if you've had a good day or not a good day, I can pick up on things that other people don't pick up on. Um, in young children, sometimes this plays out like, um, there might be something yucky on their food, like a little spot of broccoli is touching their carrot and they can't possibly eat it. Or um, the French fries are in the ketchup and they really don't want it touching, right? These like very minutia details are really, really, really important to sensitive kids. They notice everything. He got more than me. You know, they're, they're just kind of picking up on all the details. So the first trait is this depth of processing. The second common trait has to do with becoming overstimulated or overwhelmed. Um, and this is happens because we take in so much information, right? So, um, you know, you can almost imagine if, um, let's go back to this color example, if you're taking in so much color and so many visual details, um, you can imagine that in the evenings, my eyes are very happy to be shut and, and kind of turn off stimulation, right? So I can become overstimulated if I'm in an environment where there are a lot of people, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of busyness. Um, personally, I'm also an empath. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what empaths are, though not all, all highly sensitive people are not empaths but many are. And in, in my personal belief, in my experience, all empaths are highly sensitive people. So that's kind of where this um, interplay comes in. 
An empath is somebody who feels other people's emotions. Um, and for me as a child, it was really confusing because I could feel the stress and worry of other people. I could feel the joy of other people. Um, and it was very hard for me to tell what was mine and what was somebody else's. Mm -hmm. And even as an adult, sometimes I struggle with that. You know, um, like being on an airplane can be really overwhelming for me because you're in this close proximity to all these people and they've all been traveling and they've all been with people. And um, so personally, when I get onto an airplane, I've got some meditation practices that I use to get myself grounded before we literally take off and kind of shield myself from other people's energy so that I'm not just kind of absorbing it and taking it on because as an empath, I'm really, really, really good at that. And it's really, really, really bad for me. <laughs> and um, so that is one of the primary tools that I, that I teach. Um, and I teach it to children as young as three, four, five, you know, there, there are really simple ways to help children understand this practice because mm -hmm. they are so in it that they, that it all makes sense to them. You know, um, many sensitive adults have been talked out of their sensitivity. Um, we've been convinced that we're drama queens or we're overreactive or we're just, um, reading into things or we're making it up or we're just a part in it, pain in the ass. Um, and to some extent, it is true. And to some extent, um, it's because we haven't learned how to handle it. And once we learn how to handle it, all of those negative stereotypes, being a crybaby, baby, being over, overreactive, overemotional, that stuff melts away once we own our sensitivity and we're not kind of a victim to it. Oh my yeah. God. This is all like resonating with me so highly. Like you have no idea. I mean, even like what you were saying about colors, like I can, my husband and I can look, we were, we actually had this instance where we were on a date a few, few weeks ago and we were looking out over the riverfront and I was like, wow, like, look at the way, like, there was the sunset on the water. I was like, wow, look at the way the, that blue changes to the violet and then the blue violet. And then there's that, those turquoise in between, like, like, and he was like, wow. He's like, <laughs> I don't like see that. <laughs> and, and I, and I like exactly we all the colors, like I see all the colors. I totally, I'm with you with the colors and, and just picking, I don't think I'm, an empath, but I mean, it's really interesting. Like uh, even what you're saying about being overstimulated and overwhelmed, like that happens to me. I mean, I'm a, um, I'm an extrovert, you know, I like going out and being with people and things like that, but I can like really pretty easily be overwhelmed and overstimulated. Like I remember when I was in, um, high school, once I went to a Pink Floyd concert and we were like in the, you know, in the stadium and at one point it became so overwhelming for me that like, I was like, get me out of here. Like I had, I was trying to crawl over people to get out of this crowd because it was so overwhelming for me. And I just realized that, you know, you're talking and, you know, seeing that I get, I see my, that happens with my daughter. She gets overwhelmed. I mean, it, it really, um, and I, it's interesting because I can see how that feeling of that was something I, I really, really struggled with for like 27 years of my life was like feeling kind of overwhelmed by life in general. And it was when I started my steady, regular meditation practice that I even that keel. And it's, um, it was so transformative for me. Like it was a mate. I mean, it was like night and day in some ways, like between those months and the way my life is now and the way I felt so pushed and pulled by everything in life before, um, so I don't know. I'm totally, I'm totally like, oh my God, relating to everything you're saying. Yeah. I love it all. And so you're really going to enjoy um, the rest yeah, of what yeah. I have to share. I want to hear the so other ones. About halfway through the trait, but um, yeah, of course I'm uh, deeply resonating with everything that you just shared. And I'm also an extrovert, but the thing that's so interesting is 30% of highly sensitive people are extroverts. It's about 70% um, according to the research that are introverts. But the reason why it's confusing for a lot of people, and for me too, because sometimes I'll refer to myself as an extroverted introvert or an ambivert, like I can't ever really get a handle on it because when I feel comfortable, I'm extroverted. But if I don't feel safe, emotionally, energetically safe, I am not letting anything in. I am not letting anything out. I'm not wanting to engage in that environment. And that's because I'm highly sensitive. It's not because I'm an introvert. And so um, one of the the 
common traits of highly sensitive people that's common with introverts is needing downtime to process. Um, and, and that's because we become overstimulated because we take in so much information. And I don't know about you, Hunter, but for me personally, um, you know, sometimes I'll have an experience where somebody might make a comment or, um, I might have a conversation that kind of leaves me with like a little bit of a pit in my stomach and I can't in that moment really pinpoint why, but then a couple of days will pass or even just later that night, I'll go for a walk. I personally live by the beach in San Diego. So I'm really fortunate to be able to, um, go for a walk, which really helps me kind of let go of my, my, um, I call it like my worry playlist, you know, just kind of my inner tape of just like, yuck thoughts. Um, and when I allow myself to do that, that's when I'm, I can really process things and it will come to me like, Oh, that's why that upset me so much because it reminded me of this or it struck this nerve or it, you know, it took me back to not feeling heard or seen when I was younger or whatever it was. Um, but a common trait of sensitive people is needing that alone time, needing downtime. Um, and downtime doesn't always mean being alone. It could mean yoga. It could mean going for a walk. Um, generally sensitive people like these sort of more relaxed, meditative, slow paced experiences that allow us to process and really kind of sift through all of the stimulus that we've been taking in during the day. And it also helps us <clears throat> back off from that overwhelm. You know, um, sometimes when I'm working with kids, we'll talk about having like a bucket and feeling like their bucket is getting full and just like full of yucky things of other people's stuff of their own stuff of, you know, kind of whatever is going on in the day. And they can say like, mom, you just like, when you yelled at me, my bucket felt fuller or whatever, you know, we kind of give these kids these emotional tools from a young age that they can be aware of their inner bucket. And, and what happens for most of us, because we didn't get these tools as kids, is we wait until we're in our 20s or 30s, like me, um, to discover yoga and meditation, which I encourage for all sensitive people. It's not this airy-fairy stuff. It really is a practice to slow down and connect with yourself, which you must do as a, as a healthy, sensitive person. If you, if you don't find a, a, a practice for yourself, it's not possible to be healthy in your sensitivity. You are going to struggle um, and, and you don't have to. So that's why I always really encourage us from a young age, like kids can learn this stuff. They don't have to wait until they've had a rough time to discover their way back to self-care. I love to teaching self-care practices to young children um, because we need it as sensitive beings. We need that downtime to process, to mm -hmm. empty our buckets. You know, mm -hmm. um, I like to think about like yoga or meditation or a walk. Sometimes I put on music and just dance. Um, sometimes I call a friend and talk, whatever it is. I'll, I'll cook something. I don't know. I have a garden. Everybody's got their ways, right? Um, I like to think about that as like scooping out our bucket. Each one of those kind of empties out our bucket. And if we wait until it's full and it's overflowing and we're in overwhelm, then we're of no good to ourselves or anybody else. And if from a, from a young age, children learn, sensitive children learn how to keep their buckets empty and they have tools and resources to handle it when it starts to get full, then, then oh my God, they're so well equipped for, the, for life. And our world now more than ever needs healthy, sensitive beings. The, they are the people who bring um, peace and love and joy and purpose to the world. You know, the artists, the musicians, the healers, the teachers, the coaches, they are highly sensitive beings. You don't do this work if you're not highly sensitive. It's <laughs> incongruous. You know, there's a reason why most people who are um, like in an ER or first responders, they're generally not highly sensitive because we don't always do well in a crisis. You know, um, we, we generally do better when we can be, you know, more centered and grounded. Yeah. And so everybody's got a purpose and a place and, and nothing's gone wrong in sensitivity. You know, earlier when I was talking about the Porsche and the Prius, when we go to buy a car, we get, a, we get to choose, we make a choice. And when parents have children, they don't get to put in an order for what sort of temperament they'd like for their children. Yeah. And um, Hunter, you alluded to it that, you know, you, that you, that you're highly sensitive. I think you said your husband might be highly sensitive. My, I think my father, I think my your father, father. Um, yeah. And he suffered very greatly for that when he was growing up in the fifties, like it was not okay. And, um, and he suffered a lot and, and he had, his coping mechanisms are, you know, different. <laughs> and so, yeah, but, um, 
but yeah, a little bit of definitely some numbing for him. You yeah. Know? Like, well, because what happens is if we don't have tools, then we have coping mechanisms. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, the tool is, the tool is sort of the, um, it's like the proactive approach and the coping mechanism is sort of reactive, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I'm saying that with love and compassion, there is absolutely no judgment. Many sensitive people do look for coping mechanisms. Sensitive people make great addicts. They make great victims because um, when we are unhealthy, when we are struggling with who we are, that's what we draw into our life. You know, that's kind of, it's, it's just what we attract into it because it matches where we are. Um, And so I take a really loving approach to this. Like, I'm happy to help anybody where they are because we're all, we've all found ourselves in different points on this journey. And um, once we learn tools, once we learn healthy tools, and then we, um, we consistently use them. That's the other thing. You know, sometimes I work with people who aren't really ready to implement the change. You know, they're, and and I want to say, you know, personally, I went, I went gluten-free around New Year's and it took me like a good year to even decide to work with my friend who is a nutritionist. Cause I was like, I don't want to have to change. It's going to be hard. And I knew it. Um, and so it took me a while to even be ready to be ready to change. And so, um, everybody kind of starts where they are, but in order to really be this like joyful, transcendent being who's living your purpose and passion in life, you've got to come to grips with your sensitivity and you've got to own it and you've got to figure out how to harness it for the power that it is because it's a power and you can either own it or it can own you. And I've certainly been on that side of it and it sucks. It's really a hard way to go through life. And um, because sensitivity is genetic, it's an inherited trait. um, Very often, like you said, you will see it throughout the generations. And I'd say the coolest thing for me about being a parent coach for sensitive pa- parents of sensitive children is so often parents don't realize that they are highly sensitive until they seek out help for their kid who they're like, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what to do. And that's when their own healing really begins. Because in order for me to help a parent's child, I'm really giving that parent the tools for them to model and teach their own child. So it ends up being this super cool process when I get to coach parents that are new to their own sensitivity. Um, and for me, it's so exciting when it's the dads because, um, in, in North America in particular, being a sensitive boy or a sensitive man isn't really acceptable for the most part, which, um, is really too bad because again, like now more than ever, we need sensitive, logical, compassionate leaders to come forward Mm -hmm. and really, um, pave the way for this, this new approach to life of, um, you know, just <laughs> that sensitive people are just experiencing life in a different way. And it's not that we need to, um, shift our world from this desensitized world to this, you know, feathered nest of rainbows and clouds, <laughs> but it would be nice to find a middle ground where, you know, we move from this kind of hard reality world to a world that's a little more loving and compassionate and a little bit kinder to each other and a little more um, caring about how the other is experiencing things, which is a huge component of the sensitive person's experience. Yeah. Yeah. We absolutely need that. Wow. I mean, there's so much you said in there, Melissa, (laughs) I want to respond to, but you first, I'm going to go back to the four traits. So you said stronger depth of processing, becoming overstimulated and overwhelmed easily, needing downtime to process. And then what was the fourth? The fourth one is having um, emotional reactivity or emotional oh, sensitivity. Okay. So um, the way that I like to explain that is, um, let's again go to the color idea. If most people, 80% of the population, experience emotions as, let's say, sadness and happiness, um, I would think about those as like a light pink and a light blue. The highly sensitive person, (laughs) you can see where I'm going with this, experiences emotions from deep, deep despair and hopelessness, which is like an electric pink, all the way up into ecstatic joy and bliss, which is like the most beautiful cobalt blue, Hmm. right? So sensitive people experience a more saturated range of emotions. They feel things deeper. 
Wow. Wow. Yeah. This, this so resonates. It's really, really amazing. And, um, and I, I love what you're talking about, how you talk to the the parents and about how they need to, when they discover that they're highly, you know, they need to start to model this. They need to start to live this for their kids, which is sometimes we have resistance to that, right? Like, especially as moms, like we might have resistance to taking care of ourselves. There's a lot of you know, cultural pressure, not to invest in ourselves, not to take care of ourselves, not to take time for ourselves, not to, you know, use resources, which is insane and crazy because like you're saying, the sort of the best parenting is in, is in modeling, right? For, for sensitive kids too. But going back to sensitive kids, there's obviously we need to sort of stay grounded so that we can accept and handle their, intensity, <laughs> right? How do we, if we think our child's sensitive, what are some of the things that we can do to support a sensitive kid in a way that's better? Um, and what are the th- some of the things that don't work that, uh, that are, you know, in kind of the normal toolbox that might not work for sensitive kids? Yeah, it's a great question. So <clears throat> what I'd love to do is give a couple of really tangible tips um, that parents can start using immediately. But mm-hmm. I, I do want to say that, it, you know, that that question is a bigger question. Yeah. Um, we could do 10 podcasts kind of diving <laughs> into that. You know, that's why I love coaching parents. But here are a couple of takeaways that um, will work with every, any child, highly sensitive or not, but especially um, effective with the highly sensitive children. So I'm, I'll, I'll give you two tips. The first one is to become more aware of your own energy. Sensitive children, um, especially empathic children, really respond to the energy around them. So um, I know for me that as a sensitive child, and as, even as a sensitive adult, what drives me crazy is when somebody says, I'm fine, nothing's wrong, and I can feel, I can feel that something is wrong. <laughs> as a parent, What I really encourage is if you are having a hard moment, if you're struggling with something, if you're stressed, if you're annoyed with your kid, in that moment, be honest with them. Find a loving, compassionate way to say, I'm having a hard moment right now. I have a few things to deal with. And when I'm done, I'll let you know. I'm going to take a few deep breaths and then we can talk. Now's not a good time for me right? Um, Rather than kind of grinning and bearing it. And here's why it's beneficial on a couple of levels. One, for you, it feels really good to be honest. It feels really good to be able to say to somebody, I can't right now. And there's nothing wrong with saying that. In fact, that's a really healthy boundary to model for children. The other thing is that it's helping your child feel safe with you and really trust you. You're teaching them that it's okay for them to feel whatever they feel. Mm -hmm. They can say it in a kind way, right? Mm -hmm. It is okay for your child to say, mommy, I'm really angry with you right now. I don't like that you told me I can't watch that movie or whatever it is that's going on. Rather than them just rolling their eyes and stomping around the house, we want to model healthy communication. I know that um, that's something that you're really passionate about, Hunter. And so like, I can imagine that you're kind of feeling what I'm saying here. But um, for me, that's really like a, a great um, first starting point is being honest about what you're feeling and giving your child freedom to kind of do the same. Yes, yes. Uh, Melissa's watching me nod my figuratively <laughs> here because I love that. And that's so true. Like, and, and sometimes like we want to be calm and we want to be grounded. We want to be centered. So we, we're like fake mindful and that just doesn't work. It doesn't work. We have to be real. We have to be authentic, you know, and, and that model, everything you said, everything Melissa said, I am so on board with, like, you know, I'm fine and grinning and bearing it. Like when someone says that, sometimes my husband says that to me and I'm like, hmm, (laughs) <laughs> like, no, no, you're not. But, um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And I, I love, I love what you're talking about this fake mindfulness. Um, and I, I want to again, say the gift of having a sensitive child for you as the parent, this child will not allow you to bullshit your way through life. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's why my I, my mom and I wrote a book called Authentic Parenting Power, yeah. and it's because I held this mirror up to her her, her whole, my whole life, and I wouldn't allow her to um, 
to live inauthentically. And um, really, I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of the, 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 the short story of how it is that I came to do this work with her is, is that exactly. It's about um, when, when you are willing to take this journey with your sensitive child, when you are all in, when you want that, when you want to drive that Porsche in its peak, you've got to be willing to do a little bit of work to get it there. And it's your own self-work. And it's about really letting go of all of that faux mindfulness. And, and I want to say I'm guilty of it too. I mean, anybody who's on a spiritual path has been there at some point where we're like, oh God, I thought, I thought I was. And once you're, you know, when you're thinking, when you're out of that feeling, then you're kind of, you can say like, okay, now I'm in that faux mindfulness. I'm not really just present. Now I'm getting into my mind and I'm getting away from it. And your children are this gift to kind of bring you back to it. Um, I want to give you one more, one more tip to use yes, please. with the sensitive children. So this one's a little more um, uh, concrete, a little less esoteric. Um, very often I hear parents saying to, especially their sensitive children, what's wrong? Stop asking them that question. <laughs> it's not going to get you anywhere good. Um, they cannot articulate it. Um, if you've got young children, I would say five, six, seven and younger, please don't ever ask them that question. Instead, what you want to do is verbalize for them what you're seeing. So you could say something like, this is so hard for you. I can see that you're running out of patience. I can tell that your brother is bothering you. I, I can hear your belly grumbling and really wanting that cookie, right? You want to give them language so that they can begin. <laughs> this is essentially how we develop mindfulness in them, right? We, we start to give them language to connect to their experience. And of course, if you can give them emotional language so that they're really identifying with the feeling, the emotion that they're having, um, and then if you can take it even a level deeper, you can start talking about where they're feeling it somatically. So um, you could even say like, oh my gosh, your headache is really big right now. Your brother making all that noise must really be driving you up the wall. Something along those lines. Or, oh my gosh, your stomach is hurting. I bet it's feeling nervous about school that just started this week. Right. So you want to really help your kids begin to identify what they're feeling emotionally, somatically, energetically, rather than saying to them, what's wrong? They can't tell you. They need you, especially in their early years, to help them answer that question. If you've got older children, and what I'm saying is kind of new to you, it's not too late. You can still do it with your older children, you know. If you have kids coming home from school that are school agers or tweens, I know these days school agers are the new tweens. Um, again, you can still use that language. Like, I can see that it looks like this was a hard day at school for you. Looks like mm -hmm. you, you don't look super happy. You look a little bit down in the dumps. You know, do you want to go for a walk? We don't have to talk at all. How about we put on some music and dance? Mm -hmm. What would feel What would feel good for you right now? Right. So stop trying to. Um, Ask them to give you the information. Your kids can't do it. They need you to see it in them. The sensitive child really wants to be seen and understood. And if you can see them, if you can understand what's going on and verbalize it, you are just deepening your relationship with them on every level. You're helping them feel self-confident. You're building their emotional language, their emotional vocabulary. You're helping them become more mindful and present to what they're feeling. You are essentially building their toolbox so that they won't have to listen to these kind of podcasts when they're grownups <laughs> to get the skills that they didn't get as children, right? So um, if you yeah. can even, if you could do even just a little bit of, of what I um, shared today, then you and your children will really be in the right direction and well on your way to um, having a more easy, joyful experience in a desensitized world. Doesn't sound so scary now, does it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love what you said. So become aware of your own energy. Be aware that I'm fine doesn't work. <laughs> Stop asking what's wrong. And I love that what you're saying about verbalizing what you're seeing. And this is, we, we teach this in mindful parenting, talking about acknowledging what you're seeing, like saying what you're seeing. And also that's so great because it you know, it connects up that like verbal part of the brain with the emotional side of the brain and helps to become integrated. But as soon as you label something, it's just like, oh, it's like a little bit of a relief for everybody. Like even, you know, when we are practicing mindfulness meditation or even practicing to deal with difficult feelings, almost just, just that process of acknowledging what is creates relief. Just seeing what is creates relief. And it, I think the 
it's so, so important that we, we have such a tendency in our culture to jump to fixing things and to changing things and things like that. And we have to really, you know, it's okay to like want to help and to, you know, but this idea that we have to put in this, this step of just like what you're saying, verbalize what you're saying, acknowledge what's going on because it just provides so much relief that we don't even realize. And it's so simple, <laughs> you know, it's, it can be hard to change our habits, but it, it's really so simple. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because it, it really, um, it's the habit of doing it over and over again that creates the big change. You know, it's like, if we're standing at the bottom of this giant staircase, we just, we have to keep going up the step over and over and over again. It's the same thing, but we have to do it a lot in order to really have the effect that we're going for. Um, and something that, you know, really occurred to me just as you were talking Hunter is, Yes, everything just needs to be acknowledged and seen. And it's almost like once something is seen, once this emotion is recognized, it's able to kind of go away. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like if we don't see it, it keeps showing up in different ways. And and one thing that I I've seen happen with sensitive children endlessly. I mean, I I work with I coach parents all day long. So this is I live and breathe this stuff. I love it. Um what happens for many sensitive children is, let me give you an example. So let's say um, a brother and a sister are home and the brother takes the sister's toy and she feels upset that he took her toy and now she's crying and mom comes in and says, what's going on? And he says nothing. And, and she says, he took my toy. And mom says, oh, stop, give it back. And now they keep going on. And, and now, um, something else happens. And now the little girl, you know, mom says, come sit down to dinner. And she doesn't want to come sit down to dinner because mom didn't acknowledge her feelings before. And now she's upset and she's not going to listen to mom. And now it gets compounded and compounded and compounded. And the night ends up with mom screaming at this little girl because mom has lost her patience and nothing mom does is enough. And it's all because this little girl needed mom hours earlier to sit with her and say, I saw what your brother did. That wasn't nice. It was not kind. And that's not how we treat each other in this house. I'm going to let him know that that really hurt your feelings because she needed that to be seen. And so often what happens for sensitive kids is these little tiny things like, yeah, mom's probably thinking, oh my God, it happens every day. Yeah. But for this little girl, that's her whole world. Children are hyper present. It's one of the most amazing things about them. But so everything to them is really important and it really needs to be honored and and supported. And when we don't do that, things build up. And then these kids become overwhelmed, right? Their bucket is now totally full and it's overflowing. And we're angry at them for not being able to handle their emotions. But we miss the opportunity to kind of stop all of that because we weren't able to see what was going on. So, and I, I want to say it's really, really, really hard to do that. And I'm yeah. not saying it like, you guys just do it. It's so easy. Yes, of course. It's especially when we're in our own sort of heightened stress state, it's really, really hard to do it. But that's kind of um, an underlying challenge that happens in sensitive households all the time, which is why I just kind of want to shine a little spotlight on it. It might help parents be like, oh, maybe that's what happened that day. Or, okay, now I'm seeing that a little bit differently. Um, You know, becoming aware of what the dynamics are is really the first step because then you can start to see the behavior in a different way and you can interpret it differently, right? You can give your children new language to express themselves and that really starts to diminish the intensity (laughs) that's kind of going, going, um, you know, the, the inner dynamic, it can all, um, pull back a little bit. So everybody doesn't feel quite as charged. Cool. So I'm, I'm wondering like, and I'm wondering about how this was, you know, maybe when, when you were a kid or, or with the the parents you work with. So you you know, if a lot of the parents of highly sensitive kids are also highly sensitive, and they may have had a day where they are not centered. They have not done their meditation in a week because they haven't gotten enough sleep and they're, or they're, you know, <laughs> they've, had a, they've had a day and whatever. So what happens, wh- what do you say to the parents who are in this place where they're, you know, I mean, sometimes it's just like, we're not able to handle it, I guess. But what, what, what do you say to the parents when they're in this place of they're just, they're just not, they just don't have, 
you know, not running on full capacity to be able to deal with the intensity of their child. Yeah. The first thing I say is, um, it, yeah, it happens. Every parent of a sensitive child feels that way. Um, and if you're feeling that way regularly, if that's kind of your norm, it's time to do some work, right? It's time to make some changes. Um, if that's sort of happening every now and then, and you're mostly finding your way, but life happens as it does. And you just, you know, have those days every now and then, you know, I lovingly say to parents, those are the days that technology is, you know, invented for put, put some movies on and let your kids hang out on the iPad and be honest with them again, say to them, like, look, I don't have it in me today. Um, you know, I, I have one family that I've been working with for a couple of year, years now. They have five children and um, their middle one is their highly sensitive one. And um, I work both with the parents and with the 11, the 11 year old. And um, she one day was saying to me, you know, mom was so mean and she yelled at me this morning and, and, you know, it was kind of going on and on and on. And I said to her, does mom ever yell in the mornings? And she said, no, but mom had a work call and she was really busy. And I said, oh, you mean mom was having a really rough morning and she couldn't be there for you? And mom is almost always there for you. Maybe you could give mom a break that day. <laughs> I need and you to mom, talk to my child. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> totally. And mom was in the room and that was totally like her response. Like she just looked at me and said, thank you. And I was like, look, you got to give mom a break. Like she's got five kids. She runs a business. Like she's not going to be on every morning and you don't need to be mad at her because she had an off day. Cause I know that you have off days and mom loves you anyway. So let's all give each other a break. <clears throat> so, I mean, if, like I said, if that's your norm, time to do some work. If it's an every day, let your kids know you're having an off day. Give yourself a break, you know, go easy on yourself because it's life. And when we lovingly demonstrate what it looks like to have an off day, we give our kids permission to do the same thing. Yes. You know, yes. and, and, and you we all need that perfect. freedom. Exactly. We don't have to be perfect, yeah. but we do have to be honest and we do have to be authentic if we want to get that sort of behavior back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love what you're saying. <laughs> I can completely, uh, I completely love this. Like really kind of, so I'm wondering, what do you think now thinking then about highly sensitive children, what do you think about um, maybe like the work of Kim John Payne and Simplicity Parenting and the idea of reducing some of the oh, too much stimulation, too much too much in the scheduling, too too much stuff in the environment, um, too much maybe exposure to media? What do you think about that kind of thing? You know, I um, in general, it's hard to say because every family is unique and dynamic and. Personally, I work with families all over the world, not just in the United States. And so there are all sorts of cultural um, dynamics that come into play as well. Um, and I do have to say that in other countries, you know, when I, when I talk with parents about the way that they're schooling and raising their children, I gotta say, it sounds pretty good. You know, it is a little simpler. It is a little um, more scaled back. I think that um, very often, <clears throat> especially in the United States, parents um, work really hard. They are really stressed. And so sometimes they try to cope with that by, um, giving material things to their children or, um, doing, doing, doing children care about the being sensitive kids care about how present you are when you're with them. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you as a busy parent can only spend five minutes with your child a day, be present with that child in those five minutes. Um, it, you know, what else is going on in the day to day it, it, for me personally, it's less about the details and it's more about the experience going through it because two children can sit with an iPad and have very different experiences. And one I would encourage and one I would discourage, right? Mm -hmm. So um, personally, I'm a proponent of child-led schooling and development. I think that um, especially a sensitive child, typically they have a very strong inner voice. I, I work a lot with parents about helping them develop their child's intuition, their intuitive voice, helping children really connect with um, their inner calling and their drive as unconventional as it might be. Um, because I do believe that that's where our true genius emerges. Sensitive beings tend to walk a different kind of path. Usually traditional schooling is not... Um, 
the, the best environment for them. Sometimes it is, sometimes they thrive, sometimes they really struggle socially, um, even though academically they do okay. So it's really hard for me to have um, a, a generalization, but um, my default answer is if it works for your family, if it works for your child, and by that I mean if your child is self-confident, thriving, responsible, feeling fulfilled and impassioned, go for it. If your child is pulling back, if they are withdrawing, if they are um, becoming reclusive, if they are displaying any signs of anger or aggression, um, it's time to to get some support, right? Um, and shift the way that you're doing things because to me, those are not signs of um, a healthy experience. So um, everything in moderation, everything in the way that it it works for the, the well-being of the whole child. The, that's amazing. I love what you're saying. I mean, I'm just, I have light bulbs going off and think of my own experience as a kid, like loving to learn, hating school. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and my, my, we are incredibly fortunate that we, I've been involved in creating a Montessori school and we have a public charter Montessori school here. And my highly sensitive child is like the, you know, the Montessori queen, you know, where she's just like, you can't hold her back, you know, <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> amazing. Um, so, so I love that. So just looking at that child and seeing sort of where, what, what are they need? Well, I hope this is, um, I hope this is sparking kind of ideas for people because I really think that, you know, in a way, everything you're saying that we need to be extra mindful of for highly sensitive children really benefit every single child. Obviously, you know, there, there are clearly things that can benefit every single child is just sort of maybe having, you know, having time to process. Do you speak to the children about ways that they can help take care of their feelings and, and what, what do you say to them? Oh yeah. I, um, I mean, a lot of the work that I do when I work with children is, um, me giving them tools to, yes, to connect with their feelings, to express them in healthier ways. Um, I teach meditation tools and practices, like I said earlier, to ground and really protect their energy. Um, and it and it really depends on, on the child. I work with kids, you know, um, earlier when we were talking about sensitivity and you were saying that you don't really identify with being an empath, I wanted to say that um, sometimes I think about sensitivity kind of as like a broad river that goes off into these different tributaries. And so one tributary might be being an empath, another might be being, you know, really artistic and creative, another might be um, being a little bit like psychic or clairvoyant, clairaudient, clairsentient, maybe like seeing auras and colors and things like that. Um, so there are all of these kind of different ways that sensitivity emerges. Some some children um, are, I think this is important to say, because I know a lot of parents are listening here, are really sensitive in terms of their sensory processing. Um, some of the work that I do, like one of the things I'm really interested in is the overlap of high sensitivity and sensory processing disorder, which is something else entirely. In fact, I'm writing a book now kind of about the overlap of the two of them, the similarities and the differences. So some kids have more sensory sensitivity, like clothing tags are really itchy, seams bother them. I was like, I could never wear tights or stockings as a kid that drove me crazy, like lacy dresses or torture for me. Um, (laughs) Some some sensory processing disorder has sort of a whole other host of um, ways that it manifests, but very there's a lot of um, overlap or confusion with parents that have kids that have SPD or that are highly sensitive, um, and so that's kind of one of those other tributaries, which is why I was talking about it. But the thing is, is that depending on where this child falls in these sort of sensitivity rivers, I give them different tools because the child who has sensory processing needs or is like really psychic and clairvoyant and feeling energies around them, that kid needs something else entirely than the child who's um, just feeling things deeply, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, So I personally, I've got a whole, um, I want to say a whole tool shed, you know, of like all sorts of different tools and, and really kind of depending on um, what model of car I'm working with, I'll pull out different resources and, and give them different tools to really support what's going on for them. But I want to also say that um, what I really do for sensitive children that that I think is um, not to be undervalued, even though it seems so simple, is I just hear them. 
Mm. You know, I really just Mm. listen to them with my whole heart and my full presence and my appreciation for who they are and where they are in their path. Because I know that if I had somebody like that in my life, when I was younger, um, you know, not that I lament it because I wouldn't do the work that I do now if I had been absolutely understood as a child and my nest was perfectly feathered. I mean, we all have to walk through our path and, and have our, our wounds, right? Those, our wounds are actually like our launch pad into doing our work. But um, my goal is to really minimize those wounds for children these days because um, there, there's a, life is going to present them enough opportunities that um, as loving adults in their lives, we can really try to minimize um, kind of the depths and um, help them through it. So, you know, sometimes kids just want to talk to me about like a movie that they saw, you know, and that's cool. You know, they, they just want to, they just want to know that somebody is listening to them and just really caring about what they have to say. For some kids, I know it's really sad to say, it's like kind of the first time that it's happened for them. You know, Mm -hmm. so, um, so I, I meet just like with parents, I meet children where they are. Um, and then I kind of walk them through the process to get to, um, just, uh, just a healthier place where they feel more equipped to handle life. That's so cool. I love this. Um, Thank you for the work that you do. It's amazing. So where can people um, find out more about you and the work that you do? Yeah. So um, the business that my mom and I started, it's called Leading Edge Parenting. And so you can go to leadingedgeparenting.com. We're on Facebook. I also have a private Facebook group for parents of highly sensitive children. If you put in highly sensitive children, you'll find it on Facebook. Um, And I also offer a uh, a free phone call uh, for first-time clients. So if anybody's listening and is interested interested in talking with me. If you've got follow-up questions, if you're a professional, you know, professionals often reach out to me and they're like, I've never heard of this before. Um, I'm happy to chat with anybody who'd like to, um, you know, have a conversation. You can schedule that call with me through the website. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast. I, I've had a blast talking to you. I'm so glad we got to connect. Yay. Likewise, me too. Thanks, Hunter. This was so lovely. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Mindful Mama podcast. Wasn't Melissa amazing? And I had such a great time talking to her. Those four traits of highly sensitive children are really eye-opening, I think. Uh, What do you think? Do you agree? If you think so, let me know at hunter at hunterclarkfields.com or go ahead and jump into the comments for this episode at mindfulmamapodcast.com. And as always, it really helps the podcast if you could subscribe and leave a rating. Really easy to do that right on your phone. You can subscribe. You can search for the Mindful Mama podcast and leave a rating right in iTunes, right on your phone. So easy. I've been loving those great ratings and reviews coming back and people sharing it with your friends. So that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then Mindful Parenting is open for registration right now. So go ahead and check it out at mindfulparentingcourse.com. I can't wait to begin this journey and connect with you in person through the course. It's such a cool way to connect uh, and do this deeper work. It's really beautiful. And I, I really get filled up by connecting with you. I'm so excited to do that. So mindfulparentingcourse.com. And then finally, I just want to thank Dear Bill. Thank you, honey. You're not going to hear this probably, but thank you for your music and your support. And thank you, dear listener, for your support and for your ears. And I'm so glad we can connect this way. And I am wishing you a beautiful week. I'm wishing you moments of peace. I'm wishing you moments of letting go of your to-do list and being really present and just soaking up the wonder of this crazy life. Namaste. Are you frustrated with parenting? Do you want to practice conscious, compassionate parenting, but you don't know how? It's not easy, and there's no roadmap for this until now. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, creator of the Mindful Parenting Course, and I know how frustrating it is because I've been there. I really struggled as a young mom, and when I found myself yelling and triggered by my child, I knew there had to be a better way, and there is. Mindful parenting is really different from other parenting trainings. 
but they don't tell you that all of their good advice is as good as useless when our internal stress response is triggered. Mindful Parenting teaches you research-based tools and practices to reduce your stress response so that you can respond rather than react. And it teaches you exactly what to say so that you can create willing cooperation from your child. You can learn more and enroll at mindfulparentingcourse.com and you can join us for a free live training from October 9th through 13th where you'll learn why your kids don't listen to you, what punishment really teaches, the parenting truth that every pediatrician gets wrong, and the powerful hidden myth that can undermine your parenting. Sign up now at mindfulparentingcourse.com slash free training. I'll see you there.